Well, welcome well, to the October edition of the Great War Discussion Group. Uh, Stephen Dietz is going to present uh, what could be regarded as the second half of his military optics uh, presentation from, la from last month. This one on one of the unique contributions of World War I to the armamentarium of military observation and real-time intelligence, namely aerial photography. Stephen, go ahead. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, aerial photography, I, I'm going to really move fairly fast because each one of these sections that I'm going to do could easily be an hour in itself. So the first one, let's get started, hold on. I thought I had the screen there. There we go. Three, uh, to put you in the time mood, the sources I utilize are similar to before. One important sidebar, I've tried to avoid any internet statements that are incorrect or have included. And I've also tried not to include too much post-war detail. So to start off with, I have a recruitment film that was done in late 1918, early 1919. And they're using a, a ship that was donated by the French to uh, the U.S. Navy, and it was the Bidet Zodiac, and it became the Zodiac Dirigible Dash US-1. And this was shown as an immediate post-war Army recruitment film to those that were leaving the service, as well as shown in certain theaters at the time. So it's showtime. This is a shortened version, and I want to emphasize uh, I don't know why, but it's not moving forward. Hold on. There. Duh, duh. Showtime. There. Wrong screen. There we go. Now, I've, this film was originally 20 minutes in length. I've shortened, uh, I've snipped parts of it out. And I want to give you an idea how, it, even then, the importance of what it was to uh, they recognize as a whole for the airship and also at the same time for this to give you an idea of aerial photography because lots of this is using aerial motion picture photography and it lists the type of careers that you can do but nowhere is it listed is photographers but it shows locations and these are the same locations that you would have seen and at Fort Omaha where they're doing initial training on ground balloon uh, and it's similar in some ways if you've ever been to the Albuquerque Festival, uh, Bloom Festival. There's people, and off, and in just a moment, off they will go. And then at the same time, this is pretty much a promotional film. Now, in Rossfield was where the, the important thing here is I want to show is to emphasize is what we're going to be talking about in a moment is the kite balloon or the Draken in German. Uh, but you can see that the flaps uh, of the wings have not been inflated by the wind yet. How many men are used to hold it down? And the balloon goes up and with a drogue shoot and away they go. And you can see the wings inflated now. This, I really think it's important to understand how it, this was the height of technology at the time. Then here we have the Zodiac Dirigible US-1 gets a real thrill. And it, I'm only going to show part of it right now, but there's two dirigibles. Now, what you're going to see that's interesting is that it still has the Renault engines on it. And on the tails, it still is a, it has the French colors and gives you an idea of the size of a semi-rigid uh, balloon. So I'm going to fast forward it to uh, some of the different things that they would be doing you know, as a whole. But I really want to emphasize on this that this was an amazing time. Like it says, they're using wireless uh, or and if you look you'll see a microphone down below and so it's a combination of voice and telephony as well as uh, 
Morse code. And this is a shot of that same dirigible from the US built dirigible. But it, this is the whole point of this is that they're wanting to emphasize this is the future, fly now and flying for the Army Air Service, and you'll get a career that will take you into the next generation with the logic that dirigibles were the future. And we are done. And so let's come on there. So let's talk about the aerial platforms and then the tools. There were three main platforms, kites, which was a minor one, balloons slash airships, and then airplanes. All the countries participated and did aerial photography. But Europe was the most common locale. And air, with kites, the British used one that was invented by someone that was from the state of Iowa as an imitation of Buffalo Bill, and he stayed in Britain. And his kite was known as a batwing box kite, and they were primarily used for coastal photography and such. And here's an example of the gentleman getting ready to go up. There's like four or five balloons, I mean, four or five kites that are smaller, each one, to lift him into the air. The French used a box glider design, and, but they were far more safe in their own way of using a remote camera. And uh, that was generally for frontline observation, but they completely abandoned for kite balloon and airplane photography by 1916. And there's an example of a French uh, glider box kite. And you can see the camera being uh, prepped for suspension. Now, Germany did not invent kite photography. The US Navy did, but they pretty much abandoned everything uh, pre-war and they only really used for kite antennas and some manned observation. And it was none of the other war participants. But the strengths were it was quick to launch, easy to uh, use, and difficult to destroy. But the winds had to be in the right direction. And the materials were pretty much nothing but cloth uh, and wood. And that the cameras were guided by secondary lines and set off by either a pneumatic line or electric. And they were almost all single plate cameras. Airships, uh, almost all war participants used uh, balloons and airship photographies, whether they were rigid or semi-rigid or uh, non-rigid. Uh, the kite balloon was the most common design uh, for fixed observation of photography. And it was also good to know that ground balloons were never used at the front line. They were all of the, you know, torpedo shape. The construction was interesting in its own way because they used rubberized cotton and silk to laminate in animal intestines. It was amazing how many cattle gave up their large and small intestines to make the zeppelins. It's it, that's a whole different story. The rope utilized for the uh, airships and balloons were cotton, hemp, and or steel cord or cable. Aluminum was not used because of this. It had too much strength, stretch in it. As safety was parachutes and lock is the best way to say it. And using a wicker and, or aluminum uh, for uh, the baskets that, or the chambers. The kite balloon was like I said, non-powered. It was hoisted and anchored using a steel rope and a powered winch. The altitude was generally 900 to 1600 meters or 2500 to 6000 feet. It had a ceiling generally of about 9000 feet, but generally most were operating at the 6000 feet. And they offered directional stability for doing the balloon. And they were inflated with either hydrogen or light gas which is a coal, gas, methane, or some type of generator that to give that was lighter than air to give lift, which meant that they were flammable. This picture is of the kite balloon training in Brest, France, uh, by the U.S. Uh, this would have been about 1918. But its strengths was it provided a really stable view and consistent perspective. And it was really inexpensive compared to the cost for an airplane. The weaknesses were the obstructions, as well as it was a very easy target to spot. But when we talk about obstructions, uh, you can see the kite balloon over on the left side. 
the line of sight obstructions range from buildings to trees to hills as well as the camouflage and other mechanisms and so they could see a long distance but uh, it sometimes gave problems with the obstructions that might be in the way so here's an example of what a balloon view might look like and you can see the smoke that had been put up and to provide a view so it did provide some image but it, sometimes it was not always the best the dangers and risks were the weather by far some of the greatest dangers were the weather would suddenly come up and the wind would shift and it would provide problems ground fire and machine guns were very rarely at risk and because they, the balloons were generally far enough back unless there was a very lucky shot by a person uh, there was little and the aircraft guns were sometimes tried to be used but these were more of moderate risk because of the distance but it also placed the firing guns at risk for a counter artillery barrage enemy aircraft was obviously the highest risk but until they came up with incendiary bullet use it didn't really have a, a danger except for something like this so you have the, the draken they're observing and here comes a plane and they have to get out. Now, watch how quickly. This is real time speed of how fast that plane, that balloon goes up in flames. I mean, it's just amazing how it just, if you saw pictures of the Hindenburg, it's the same thing. This thing is just literally burning up in a moment. So the observers had to get out very quickly. Whoops, back. So we moved to the non-tethered blimp style which were more like a tight balloon but it, that was powered it had used an aircraft frame underneath without frames and a very low powered aircraft engine and similar height 2500 to 10,000 feet but limited exceptions that were naval for armament and the british and the french in the united states were the primary users of this and they utilized radio telephony and heliography interestingly enough and this is the British version. And if you look at this plane fuselage underneath, it very much looks like a airplane held on to a balloon. Semi-rigid, now the difference between a rigid, I mean, and semi-rigid and, and a blimp style was that the semi-rigid would have a keel underneath and usually that was wood or aluminum. And it would have the same altitude as the non-rigid balloons. And once again, it was that they were larger. And that Zodiac blimp that we saw earlier were an example of a semi-rigid where that keel went from the front of the balloon clear to the back. And that play, that is semi-rigid, the Zodiac could carry 25 people where that prior blimp only would carry two. Rigid were obviously the Zeppelin and R series. And aerial photography was pretty much limited to bombing observation in the Mideast, London, and Paris, where the Zeppelins were really utilized. And it was not ever really utilized for general reconnaissance otherwise. And it give an example of the length of the nine, you know, it's amazing how large and long those were. So we moved to airplane photography. Before the war, aeroplane, and I love the use of that word, and it changes from aeroplane to airplane sometime around 1916, 1917, when you're doing research. And it was utilized pretty much as a survey tool, but even then it was recognized as a war tool. And, but it was originally just secondary tool to the observer, but it became quickly the primary tool for air reconnaissance. And it became more integral to observation and plane use as the war progressed. It's amazing to know that between a half to a million photographs were taken over just the Western Front by both sides. The French and the Germans were the first to utilize air photography, and they used the Gore's air camera as well. The French used an identical camera that was a, a direct copy of the Gore's, and that was because Gore's was active in Paris up until the war was declared, and they were single plate cameras. And late 1914 of September, the Watson camera made its debut on a Blario, and it was identical to Gore's. And it was a very, they used that camera, which was a standardized model up until the end of the war, 
that Watson camera. This quote speaks, uh, you know, to both the RFC as well as the Gores and, and how similar they were and right before the war began. For aerial photography, there are too, way too many planes. Any plane that flew was likely used at some point as an aerial photography if it was a two-seater. Some single seats observations uh, had uh, a camera frame attached, but the two-seaters were the primary. And they had a coal cut out in the front and the side mounted. It, it was just amazing how they would utilize it as well as handheld cameras. These were the most common, whether we're talking early, which is pre-1916, to later, which is 1916 to the end of the war. And you'll see that the cauldron is used pretty much throughout the war, as well as the Rumplers uh, C4 and C7 uh, became the machine of choice for Germany. The United States used the DH4 or really what was ever in use. Uh, it's just literally it. Uh, they were pretty much used what was available. Eddie Rickenbacker in his book, The Flying Circus, um, has this one quote that I think speaks so highly. He can't, uh, the Newport had a ceiling of like around 19,000 feet and the Rumpler had a ceiling of 24,000. So you can't, he can't get high enough to even take a shot and it's just going, moving along. So here was a general idea of the ceiling. 2,000 feet ceiling for most kites, 6,500 feet for the uh, Taub, 9,000 feet for the kite balloon, 10,000 for the Blario BE-2, uh, the Caudron 14, uh, the French AR-1 18, and as the war progressed, it just gets higher and higher. And with the uh, Rumpler C-7 and with being pretty much the top of the for the altitude. Something that Charlie and I were talking about before the uh, talk began, a brief history. The initial aerial photography was done in Paris, 1858 with the uh, Daguerre type. It was 15 to 20 seconds exposure to take that picture. Now, keep in mind that was probably the successful one because when you think how long you're trying to keep a steady picture, uh, in a move in a balloon, that's not that easy to do. McClellan in 1862 did a, a glass plate uh, uh, for the Civil War, but it was more for effect than actual observation. And then there were attempts at aerial photography, but it was more of a military novelty until the First World War. The media is important to consider because initially all still cameras used plate negatives and film cameras were really not introduced until 1915 or not even really accepted until later in the war. Uh, the plate size was totally dependent upon the country of, uh, of use because the Germans used a different size than the French, which was a different size than British and, all, and so on. And you can see I've converted it from metric, but four by five, seven by nine to a 12 inch square uh, were common uh, sizes, with the seven by nine being the most recta common rectangular size. And these were plates were placed in single or multi-plate magazines for the camera, depending upon the camera utilized. Plates were better for photogrammetry and speed at times when, when they were back. It was provided a good flat surface, but that glass plate was very fragile. We're talking a very thin glass plate and it required manual to semi-automatic change for the camera and the observer had to change the magazine with each uh, you know use film offered way more exposures but the higher the altitude and the cold they became brittle and would tear and curl at higher altitude and the larger formats meaning that they would go with an, a seven or an eight inch uh, diagonal film had greater curl potential than a smaller two inch, two by three inch. So, it, but one thing about the film, it allowed easier and more consistent photo mosaic because they could take a picture, take a picture, take a picture and allowed to create mosaics much easier than the plates, which would have to be overlaid. And that there was anywhere from 30 to a hundred exposures on a roll of film. And they, by 1917, they'd improved the mechanisms to reduce that film curl. Speeds were really slow in comparison, but that's why they flew on very sunny days. 
Now, the lenses were all fixed to greater than 700 feet uh, for the aerial photography with a wide angle being only a three inch. And that would be comparable to like a 90 to 100 millimeter lens to a 50 inch would be, would be comparable to a 2000 or 4000 millimeter lens for a camera today. The lens used were dependent upon the altitude and the camera itself. The most common aperture was about f 5.9 and but some would be in low light situations used for 2.9 or f3.5. Shutter speeds were generally set before the flight but it would be automatic you know by the observer they would adjust the speed and with focal plane shutters they could adjust them to a, a infinite number they were not set like a 200 300 or whatever. There were two types of shutters. There was a focal plane, which is what's the most common uh, shutter that was in modern cameras, or the older shutter, the leaf shutter, which would open and close uh, the lens to expose the emulsion. The most successful solution, like it says, is was the Fulmer Schwing, which was better known later as the Graflex. And the focal plane was used by most aerial cameras by the end of the war. Now, I spoke about this last month. It was all about the glass. I discussed it a little bit more, but optical glass shortages resulted in scavenging by the French and the British to, from down German planes and balloons. And it, it was considered a prize find to get good German glass that would be utilized for camera lens. And this was repeated when the US joined, but they also did a call out. And, but, you know, good camera glass would sometimes be taken from one lens and recombined to create a needed glass. And they'd also use filters to allow panchromatic capability and cut through the haze. So here's an example of National Geographic in 1917-1918 of donate your camera lens. So the shortage were pretty much resolved by the British and French by 1917. And these are a sampling of the major lens manufacturers. Gors, Zeiss, Voigtlander uh, for the Germans, Lecoeur, Berthold, Krauss, Aldus, all of these were the common manufacturers at the time. Now, Flying Magazine is a great resource. And one of the things that they talk about is, you know, they talk about how the high quality that is sent by February 18 of being able with good glass to see how the negatives would be. I spoke earlier about the mag magazines. There were three different types of magazines, single plate, which was a single image, and you had to change with each exposure. And it, there were as many as 10 steps to change uh, with a plane moving from getting the uh, magazine into the camera, exposing it, and then putting it back in to the hold area. Multiplate was the same way, but you could do six to 12 images before you had to do that 10 step process. Film would go from exposed, sort of like the old box camera, it would advance the roll all the way along. They were driven either by a spring mechanism or propeller as this shows. The propeller as a whole uh, would It'd be continuously spinning and then activated by a clutch when the exposure was driven and then would move the next plate forward into position. There were many issues faced uh, with the aerial cameras. There, the wood parts would expand and shrinkage and that uh, when you're dealing with altitudes of 18 to 20,000 feet, the camera itself would potentially have a shrinkage and expansion just because you'd need to have, make sure that the pressure on the inside of the case matched the outside. So there'd have to be valves as well. There'd also be potential for moisture condensation, which was an enemy both of the lens and the case. And once again, the quality of the media and glass. Vibration was not an issue for the kite balloon, but you had to make sure that your uh, vibration was at a minimum. It's interesting, handheld cameras would actually be far steadier than direct mount on the cameras, even with a rubberized mount. 
But that's why they try to go with as fast of an exposure as possible. Haze and other types of obstructions would make a difference as well. Once again, aerial cameras, and I'm just going to quickly go through some of the images of the aerial cameras. This one was a little bigger than at the size of an old Polaroid, and it was made, it said to fit into a pocket. It never made it into production, but it's interesting in its own way because it was able to hold 75 exposures and advertised in a number of American magazines. But this is a U.S. example, and you can see right there, there are seven different uh, cameras, and almost all of them are uh, film cameras. You can't really tell, but they are film cameras. They're not plate. This is the Fulmer & Schwing Model A camera, and the all the different steps that you had to do by it went well beyond because like step D was just opening up the cover so that it could be viewed out step in. And here's the, uh, that Fulmer and Schwing in use. The K1 was the first really successful uh, large format uh, that the size of that film was nine inches across so that's a very large nine by nine exposure here was the german and uh, you'll see a similar style of the gores later they all have a very similar style of design this was captured german uh, cameras and you can see how they all get bigger and squarer and a box to hold the, the cameras. The, give you an idea of the height or size of the cameras. This is a French, another French version without the length of the tube uh, to protect. A British one with a multi bay magazine, but it's got a manual advance for the magazine that you see over to the right. The Williamson with the propeller driven uh, magazine another Williamson with a propeller driven magazine. And then you get stereopticon type uh, McKenzie uh, stereo photographs. Stereo was very useful for doing very different types of shots. And they, when we get into talking about photogrammetry in a moment or two. And then the Thornton Pickard, uh, it looks like a Lewis gun, but all it would do is do one shot of the camera that was in there and the whole purpose was to give an idea of how accurate the individual was in, when he pulled the trigger. The only have a drawing of the Pisarini Modini of the Italian, but it looks very similar to any of the others. The Gore, like I said, is very similar. This is the type that from 1914 and look at the size of that lens in the front. That is probably three and a half inches across. Training. The Americans were the first to really do a very professional training photography school. The Germans did it part of their flight observation, but uh, the Germans uh, just had it as a part. French were the least uh, organized, and they were pretty much unique because they every individual unit had to train their own. So the quality of that also suffered and went ahead. Now, here's an example of the Kodak Training School in 1918. You can't really see it, but there's approximately 11 cameras in that picture. Uh, if you go back and when you, if you download the presentation that was sent to you, you, you can look and you can count how many cameras there are in that picture. Finally, we talk about types of photography and there's air to air, air to ground, and moving picture photography. Now, Air to air was the least common, and it, you would lots of times find the individuals, the pilots, when they were, or the observers, would pull out a pocket camera and take a quick picture. When the snapshots exhibit opens, take a look at there's a Kodak vest pocket as well as a Gore's uh, pocket camera, and both of those are very common to what would have been used. Uh, the air to ground were what I talked about, stereo and multi-camera photographs, which led to photogrammetry and then moving picture photography. Here's an air to air example. 
Now, Air to Air still, it still was rare, but it was generally for taking pictures of other planes in the air. And like I said earlier, World War I gun cameras were not the same as World War II. They were in, utilized for training, not for actual in-flight use. There was one camera that was used for in-flight use, but it was not considered successful. And that's this example here. You can see it matched to a barrel of a gun, but it was never really widely used. Now, let's a quick sidebar. There is a book called Death in the Air by Wesley Archer. It was a bestseller of the 1930s, and that the pictures were worth tens of thousands of dollars at the time because, uh, but it was one of the biggest war photography frauds that was not solved until 1987. If you are interested, do a Google on the Cockburn Lang hoax. And they figured out how it was done through both research as well as uh, the journals that were kept by, and that the photos were just too real or lucky not to be saved. This was the type of camera that might have been used but this was what was captured. And you'd think that there would be a, uh, a pilot who was in a single engine plane taking a picture just at the right time. I don't think so. But that's what a lot of people thought. There was no way to really do that. Air to ground, which is what the majority of air photography was done, was a single exposure or stereo photos, which offered a 3D effect, sort of like the old stereo optical type and it may be one or more cameras. And then photogrammetry versus stereo photography. Photogrammetry is a comparison of before and after, and you're looking for differences, and it's an analysis tool. And single and stereo images were both used for photogrammetry. Aerial moving pictures were generally used for propaganda and promotional. There were some done, but they were all hand cranked. The Germans used the RK, French used the Parvo, British used a couple of others, but uh, the US primarily used the Parvo or the Eastman. And the, these are examples of the cameras that would have been used, the Ackley, the Moy and Bestie, which I've meant to put into that. But you can see that they all look like old fashioned cameras. And here's an example of one that's mounted. Now, this is the final act, and I could do a whole hour presentation on this one section. It, the process was prepping the cam, uh, the platform and the camera, meaning the type balloon and camera, getting to the target, taking the photo, getting the exposed plate back to be processed, and then the back, once it was processed, to review and analyze. Each step was extremely complex and required a specific skill. Now, this is taken from the Flying Journal of January 1917, and I don't really want to spend too much time to allow you to read it, but it speaks to the point of that the planes, after they come in flying over the enemy trenches at four or 5,000 feet, photographs were taken, getting them back, and then examine them and process them so that they could then discover if there were hidden artillery or hidden changes. So getting the platform ready, so it was a tight balloon to an airplane, you'd inflate the balloon, time to prepare the plane and get it, the cameras ready, get the unexposed plates and cameras of film and placed on the, on the plane, put it, uh, one in the camera and then the storage and then mount it and get it aloft. And then you get to the uh, target and it was all dependent upon weather conditions. And it obviously best were a clear day with minimal clouds. And worst was when it was clear at the aerodrome, but bad if, if, once you're aloft. To deal with the enemy aircraft and anti-aircraft guns, once you were over the target was another diversion. Now, Airspeed increased with each year, and that's the bottom line sort of shows you that it starts off at about 60 miles per hour, and it's 120 plus by the end of the war. Taking the photos, and you have to do all the procedurals of getting the photo taken, but you have to also be looking out for anti-aircraft, uh, air 
planes that are coming to get you. And if the photo was 40 miles away, it might take two hours to just get to taking the photos because you had to spiral up from the aerodrome, travel to the target, take a picture, and then and evading, and then get back. And the camera mounting, like I said earlier, would either be handheld, front mounted, side mounted, and the observer's job, watch, use the camera, uh, use the gun if you had one installed, position the camera, final setting, trigger the exposure, advance, and then assure the plate was advanced correctly because you could always have the plate get stuck. Now, when you're taking the photos, you have the difference between oblique and vertical photographs. And perspective issues are critical when you're trying to do observation. And vertical were far more useful for analysis and preferred whenever possible. But when you're doing long uh, shots, oblique was commonly used. So you would have fixed bottoms and side mounted cameras for the vertical photographs. So here's a BE2, and I have the BE2 pull, the camera pulled away, but it would generally be side mounted. And it would be traveling at about height of 10,000 feet, and you'd have about one mile occlusion of the lens. And so they would be trying to take a picture as double as possible. And this might be one example of the type of shot they would get. This is slightly oblique, but it still does an example of what individual. Here's a better example of what an oblique picture is, where you can see in the distance the secondary lines. The soldiers, this picture was probably done at an altitude of 4,000 feet, because if you look carefully, you can see the soldiers advancing on uh, the no man's land towards the trenches. Here's a vertical view by a bomber, and you can see the bombs dropping. And we're talking about maximum height, and you can see the bombs dropping down to the plane. And this was an early example of what would be done for a vertical view. Taking the photos, like I said, there would be cameras mounted in front, and this is an example of a 120 meter camera obliquely mounted through the front of the camera on a Caldron G3. And on a French AR-1, they had a little hole partition cut out, and they would lift, literally lift it up, stick in a camera that would normally be handheld, and point stick it through, and that's how they would take the picture, rather than using the camera like seen in the picture above. Then the British would use side-mounted with magazine that would be manually advanced. And this is an example of a single uh, single man doing observation. But this one is interesting itself. This is a German uh, shot, and uh, he pulls out the camera. You can tell it's German just because of the helmet of the pilot. He takes a picture, and it, you have an oblique shot there of them flying. And then at the same time, it, what's amazing to me, this was all done the, using a motion picture camera, and then he'd get back in to change the film. Oops, let's go. Come on. There. And then they'd have to return. Kite balloons and some planes would use small parachutes or drag chutes attached to an anchor cable uh, for the kite balloons and then drop the plates down to the ground crew. Airplanes would return as quickly as possible to the aerodrome and uh, trying to avoid any aircraft. And they would, it, it was highly sought after to get by the enemy aircraft to stop uh, uh, observations, obviously. But the photo technicians would be waiting to retrieve, and they would first put them into a developing shed or a truck. And here's an example, though, of a little parachute with exposures. Plate processing was much faster than film because you had one exposure for the plate. Film processing was slow by assuring the film was not torn or stuck together. But it also had an added bonus is that it was nitrate based. And in the chemicals, it could spontaneously ignite during the processing, which could add to the joy. So film had many benefits, but that wasn't one of them. But as developing stations mounted, the trucks were realized not to be a quick way to do it. And so they were put literally developing sheds at the aerodrome and then taken by motorcycle uh, delivery to the general staff and corps. 
And then they would have groups that would analyze the photos. And, in, and the sophistication increased with each year. And the early analysis was very simple changes until photogrammetry and, and stereo photography became more common by 1917. The detailed photographs could identify number of men, the artillery details, and that with the photogrammetry, they could literally look at the differences of camouflage emplacements. And this, another quote from Flying Magazine, talking about how the minute details, and if they sent 50 shells, they could see 50 shell holes. So this is a simple single shot, and you can see the trench work. And here's a mosaic of all the different shots, a French version of the mosaic. And here would be the sold uh, individuals trying to do an overlay, trying to match up the photographs on a wall, and it's sort of like a reverse picture puzzle of creating, and you can see them trying to create an, for analysis at the same time. After the war, aerial photography really advanced dramatically, and Arthur Brock created a improved photogrammetry mechanisms in 1917, but they weren't even utilized until after the war. The military, uh, USGS, and private industry adopted almost all the major elements, and the multi-lens camera came into being to provide it 3D perspectives. But as with everything, the price dropped. This is another example of you can buy, you can see this in a National Geographic magazine in 1921 of an Eastman Aero camera, as if the, any of the pilots, and this was a four by five Aero A1 for only $361. Now, when you consider how $361 would be comparable to, to close to $10,000 today, but still for the professional, that was considered a worthwhile investment. Here was the Fairchild T2, the first truly dedicated photogrammetry post war with th literally three-dimensional image capability. So my presentation is done. I thought about providing you a bonus film, but I want to emphasize this one's really interesting. And it was done in 1919 by the French called Dirigible sur la Chambre de Battle. And it is done in 1919, and they are flying over the trenches and all of the ruined cities. And it's an amazing film in itself. If you like, I'm planning to post it up on my archive.org website as well as my the other film uh, for viewing as well. But thank you all for listening to me, and I hope that I didn't go too fast, but provided you useful information. Very good, Steve. Uh, does anyone have questions? There's all kinds of things I guess you could ask. I, I had one question, Steve, and that was... Uh... I was under the impression that um, 20,000 feet altitude was um, really difficult for most pilots because of the lack of oxygen up there. Um, yes. I noticed you went up as high as what, 22, 24. Could you speak to that a little bit? Sure can. Um, the Zeppelins are a good example of going above the 20,000. Uh, foot range, and they utilize the rumplers, utilize the same mechanisms as the zeppelins of using air mask with uh, supplemental oxygen up when they got up above 20,000 feet. And uh, to your point, also in a different book uh, by Brickenbacher, he spoke of become his term was becoming daft when he got above a certain altitude and that he had to really watch himself. And he knew that once he got above a certain altitude, when he was looking for enemy aircraft, he would uh, sort of lose his concentration and have to drop down just to regain his breath. Thank you. Steve, what about the hazards of aerial photography? Uh, a lot of the activities of fighter pilots was shooting down observation planes. In fact, that's actually why planes were, that's why they, they invented fighter pilots, was so they could get the uh, uh, observation planes from the other side, and it sort of escalated from there. Uh, you're absolutely right. The observation plane 
was considered the golden egg for a pilot. I forget the, it was considered, at least for the Germans, it was considered a higher, I uh, want to say, achievement to get the observation than to get another fighter. Uh, because they knew that the intelligence that would be brought back by the observation pilot was uh, truly, uh, you know, things that they, it was sort of like having a spy in your midst. Uh, I can't, there's a book that's in German that I can, school, my schoolboy German could partially translate, but it was uh, basically a book about Richthofen, and his greatest day was that he got two observation planes in one day. I think it's interesting that the uh, parachute was widely used in balloons, but uh, really all during the war, the, the airplane pilots were by and large refused to use uh, parachutes. Some people say that's because the balloon observers were generally enlisted men and the airplane pilots were generally officers and it's well known in military services that sergeants have a lot more common sense than officers. Would you care to comment? Uh, and there's also the issue of most of the airplanes, the gas tanks were above uh, uh, the pilot. Uh, they were in, they, uh, they were gravity fed. And so the danger for a pilot uh, on many of these gas tanks is that when the, uh, the observer was more willing to put, get a parachute than the pilot, and the pilot uh, to get out of the plane and to jump was it, there was no way to hold the plane steady while he did that. While the observer would lots of times have, if it was a two seater, would have a parachute, but that didn't necessarily mean that it was utilized. But the observer was the one that usually had the parachute, but the pilot did not in part because of the issue of the danger of being burned and the parachute getting caught on the plane because the back then there was no you know free fall and uh, if mike booth were here i'd ask him to speak to that he may have more uh, uh, steve than i could yeah steve i had one comment um I don't know where I read this, but they were saying that the pilots didn't have parachutes because they'd use them. Now, I don't know if that was a, I don't know if that was true or not, but, uh, you know, rather than get into a fight that you're going to lose, you just get bailout. I, I don't know if that's true. I also know from my uh, research on deaths that uh, the, the Americans only lost one uh, balloonist that, that had died. They had parachutes and they got out. And they were they were generally safe. Only one of them died, and that I I would believe that. And if you saw how quickly that plane went up, I mean that balloon went up in flames. And you wanted to get out of that plane. I mean out of that uh, the basket as quickly as possible because you literally had seconds. Where a plane a pilot may think they had more control. And they're trying to steer it back towards land. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you hear about these planes that literally would collapse in on themselves uh, in the air, it, it would be a traumatic experience. And that to go from gliding along to suddenly everything collapse on you. But the other thing that keep in mind is that the lift every pound was precious and when considered the the weight for the uh, ammunition the weight for the uh, various other things of the plane a parachute uh, pilot may have said he'd rather have more uh, a few more rounds in his gun than uh, uh, something to sit on but when you look at the seats most of the planes that i've looked at and studied really did not have room for a parachute to sit on all right any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Steve.